What's up guys, on this episode we're gonna be covering uh, barking and lunging, um, the basics with your puppy, what to get started with, how to keep sessions short, what else do we have here? Dogs that are not good with children and much more on episode 21 of Dog Behavior Question Tuesday. What's up guys, this is Blake Rodriguez with Dream Come True Canine and this is episode 21 of Dog Behavior Question Tuesday. Um, we have some questions. I actually just a minute ago had a chance to read through them. I'm gonna tell you right now, I do take kindly <laughs> to most criticism. Um, I know a couple of you guys, friends and people that are fans of the show did PM, email, Instagram, uh, Facebook message, all that stuff. Uh, because on a couple episodes ago, I was eating. I'm gonna tell you right now, I just bought some espresso uh, peanuts over there that I wanna devour, but I'm gonna wait till after the show to eat it. So I do, I do take um, what you guys tell me to, to heart, and apparently it was kind of annoying to listen to me eat. So I apologize for that. We're gonna jump right into it, show you who we got here. We have uh, Samson and Soko who are sleeping. We got Penny, you guys have been following her. I've been doing some Periscope sessions on her. She's hanging out. She was with us for high anxiety, high, high anxiety, dog and human aggression. We got Muffin over there. I do apologize, has not been biting the owner, but will be territorial and possessive of the owner and a couple of other things. Um, we got my man PJ, who's done a board and train a little bit out of practice. My man is hanging out. Nino Man, he's like our very second YouTube video ever. Um, I believe second, second or third, something like that. We got Herm, Scorman Herman, who's also done a board and train with us in the past. We got new board and train buddy here, Cole, who uh, we almost didn't have up here, but I know he can hold a place. He's still really early in his program. Got kicked out of doggy daycare, um, is biting the assistants, um, lots of stuff that are not good. And then we got Sofa Loafers, Sophie doing things over here, just kind of hanging out. She'd rather be playing right now, now that she figured out how to do it. That's what she'd rather be doing. But we're gonna get right into this show. Andrew, uh, the cameraman uh, and head trainer is behind us. I am gonna, you're not, you guys are not depriving me of my coffee. I'll tell you that, all right? I'm not gonna eat, but I am gonna drink coffee. So the first question is from Shannon Cohen. My girl Chloe loves everyone except children. Seems to be anyone under 12 or so. We don't have many children visit our home to help socialize her, so. I take her to public places muzzled to try to acclimate her to them. This isn't working because I'm too scared to allow any child close. How do I resolve this issue? I hate that I can't allow her to be a dog because of her lunging at children. Help. Okay, well there's a couple things here. Um, children are much more animated than the average human being, right? If you notice dogs that are nervous and insecure or act out aggressively, that stems from some type of fear or insecurity, um, they tend to be nervous and scared of the things that are not normal, right? Um, they walk down the same street every day and then all of a sudden there's a garbage can in the middle of the street and they're weirded out by it. Um, people, normal walking patterns are fine. All of a sudden you get the old man in the walker or somebody that walks with a limp and, and that sets a dog off. Children are like these little alien creatures <laughs> who are just kind of running around animated, and, and a lot of times they are, a lot of times they are very, very different. It's play, 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 go, go, go. So that type of experience is tough for a dog when they're not used to it. So a couple things. It's great that you're muzzling your dog for safety issues, especially if you're a little bit nervous. Um, I will go ahead and say that you need to stop trying to rush your your dog or kids coming up to your dog to meet and just get your dog comfortable with being in an area while stuff is happening, while stuff is going on. So assuming that it's pretty bad and your dog is struggling to see and being concerned or really trying to avoid, have your dog just learning how to relax while life goes on around. Get to that point. That might take you a week. You might have gotten there already. It might take you a month. It might take you two months. Who knows? Get to that point. What you're gonna do there is any child that ever comes to the point that they're gonna introduce or actually come to try to pet your dog, 
you are going to be in control of that child. You're going to know that child. It's a child that's taking direction, not doing their own thing. More importantly, prior to this, you are going to work on developing solid recall and a plan B, a dog that understands that when they're getting nervous, they can choose an alternative route or a solution. Another thing that must be taught, when the dog is nervous and thinking about resorting into maybe snapping, they get a strong correction. And you guys don't hear me talk about this too often, but this is 100% merited. A correction that is going to correct the behavior, that is actually going to prevent them from wanting to do that again. It's gonna get them to think before they do that again. And then you're gonna teach them, yeah, but you can do this. So this becomes a, alter a better alternative choice. Some people might disagree with this, that's fine. This is not your show, right? Um, but I am gonna say, it's, for me, it's very important. I wanna establish right off the bat, that is not a choice that you can even think about choosing between. If you're gonna choose between the right choice and a choice, it's not gonna be that, right? It's gonna be choosing to tolerate or choosing to move away. I can call you away. So your recall needs to be good. Right? Um, really, really important, your leash pressure so the dog knows that if it's too much, they have another solution right? to, to actually walk away from that. Um, what I would also suggest is getting used to working your dog for food, yourself, where your dog is working for the markers. We use three markers, good, yes, and no, but your dog is used to working, being hand-fed, being hand-fed, being hand-fed. And you don't need to necessarily be around a thousand kids, but you want that one kid when you're at, when you're at that point where a dog's already taking food from you, and now the dog must take food from the kid. This is not the kid rushing over to greet the dog. This is the dog maybe coming over to be allowed to smell in, in your house once the dog is already accustomed to a kid being there and not caring, not giving a crap, right? When that happens, you have a dog that you can release off a of place, let's say like these dogs. None of these dogs care, right? You can release the dog off a of place in that state of mind. You're eating my... I, this is because, I, because I'm taking your guys' advice. This guy's over here off camera eating my almonds, my espresso coffee almonds, and I'm over here victim to that, right? And then we got people dancing in the background. Look at this guy over here. Um, so what was I, where was I going with this? You want a dog that is already a little bit curious and already a little bit hungry and a kid that's not doing this. If you're on leash, and it's a muzzle um, that can be, the dog can drink water through. It's a muzzle that a dog can take food or treats through, uh, ideally their own food. What you're gonna do is in your house or something with a kid that you know, or in an area where your dog is comfortable already taking food. Your dog's not taking food, your dog's not comfortable yet, so we gotta work the dog a little bit more. But um, get to the point where if this is my hand, the dog comes up a little bit curiously, the hand is open, I'm not extending, I'm just like this, the dog takes the food, and then the owner, good boy, calls them right back, pet, and then goes back to place. And you slowly work into them knowing that they can take food without taking food and a kid or a human thinking that that's permission to now pet, hug, smother, kiss, and do that. That's too overwhelming. And that's why dogs get nervous. So you really gotta take your time with that. There's so much more we can cover. Um, really get the core foundation stuff in place so that we can be in a position to actually work on the problem, right? Hopefully that makes sense. Take your time. Right, and consult a professional, because um, that's really important, or send me over to you. Um, what else do we have? Basil, hi Blake, watch your rollerblading video from last week, it's awesome. Such a good role model, or such good role models. I noticed you use the command close with Soko. Do you use that instead of heel, or is it different? I'm asking because as a very outdoor person, I'd like to teach my dog to not roam too far, but not necessarily stick too close either something in between where he's just close enough to keep checking in. How would you teach that? Um, would it have to be an actual command or would you just build it as a habit? Thanks in advance. Okay, well first off, commands for me, anything that I teach that are commands that I think are important, I wanna make them habitual, right? Habitual commands, I wake up in the morning, I brush my teeth. I don't think about doing it, I don't think of it as a chore, I get dressed before I head out the door. Right? Those are all things that have become habits, so we do it without thinking about it. Um, you want to drill these commands until it becomes a habit. Now, for my close commands, my close is a heel. I'm pretty loose with that because I'm not a precision, obedience, like competition dog trainer. Um, but when I say close, my dog does heel into that, right? Um, 
Well, I guess he's sleeping right now. I was going to have Andrew do a, a little a little heel command with Samson, but um, but yeah, we'll let him sleep right now. But when I'm rollerblading, I want him to know that if I say close, you're kind of you're sticking close to me, but you're over there. I want you in this area. And, and I can allow it with what he tries on the first attempt. If that's not enough, I can say no close and bring him in a little bit more. So that is my heel command. The command that we do use um, for a loose kind of stay around me but kind of do your thing is let's go. So here is a very specific, I want you in here, I want you to sit, I want you to look at me. Let's go is a very... Like if you're hiking outdoorsy like you, we're walking in this direction, my dog is behind me, or for this example, let's say my dog is ahead of me and we're walking in this direction, I see a trail and I wanna start heading that way, I'm going to let go my dog, which is just kind of, usually on a remote from far away, a tap on the shoulder, indication that I don't need you on a, on a recall here, but I need you to understand that we're heading this way and I want you to change directions, right? So a lot of times when I'm practicing the dog just staying in my area but not specific, I'm always turning away and getting the dog to follow. So it's just a little tap, hey, we're doing this now. Hey, we're doing this now. Hey, we're doing this now. Um, and that's how we teach it. We teach that with long lines and remote collars just so the dog understands that when they feel that let's go, um, whether it's on a leash or on a remote, they go, oh, that's this guy talking to me. We're going this way now. Thanks for the heads up. Rather than them, than them just running having no clue, and all of a sudden they turn around, they didn't realize I was going down there for two minutes, now they have to catch up, right? So that's pretty much how we teach. Um, yeah, we're good. Why don't you have your mic on? I bought this guy a tripod, we bought a bunch of, a bunch of these mics, and he's over here, now I gotta reiterate, go ahead. That, that, that's a good point. That's a really good point. So what Andrew said is just basically like a lot of that, that what was that big word that you use? Arbitrary. That arbitrary circle. I don't, I don't know fancy words like this. I just train dogs, right? I teach simple commands. Sit here, come. Um, uh, that arbitrary circle, which is just kind of like natural, that comes naturally if you have a dog that's used to taking direction from you. So you have to start setting more rules and boundaries and stuff for your dog and regularly give your dog direction because they'll kind of naturally know that while they're kind of roaming, doing their own thing, you're the one that is setting the tone of how far to roam, how far, hey, nope, we're coming this way, and eventually it becomes a natural thing. Oh, when we're doing this, I can stay around. You know, um, I just got to keep tabs. But if you have a dog that's not used to being outside, not used to taking direction from you, and you're trying to get them off a leash, the dog is gonna be so like far gone by all the smells, all the scents, all the wildlife. They're not, you're like secondary, if not fifth on their list to everything else distraction wise. So you have to be relevant. That's really, really important. And then when you are, it's natural. Like uh, what Andrew was saying is he took Samson, and if you watch our Instagram page, uh, like, and, and his as well, um, you'll see that he took Samson and, um, and Maxwell hiking, and it was just a natural thing. He probably used it every now and then to say bring it in or get him close, but it was just the dogs kind of ran into their thing as Andrew and, and whoever he was hiking with stayed in motion. They were the ones that, that gave something to follow. They weren't following their dogs, you know what I mean? Um, so that's pretty much that. Um, let's see where else we are here. Herrera, hi Blake, we have a giant schnauzer, schnauz, schnauzer, uh, nine weeks old. How do we start with a puppy teaching sit, then after mastering this down, how do we keep the sections, or how long do we keep the sessions and introduce the prong collar, which becomes, okay. So I, I get the gist of this here. Uh, a couple things. Basics really, really easy. If you have a nine week old dog, positive reinforcement based foundation. You don't need to go into corrections or anything yet. You kind of want to let your dog goof off a little bit. I personally, we're getting to the point now where like four to like six months, seven months is where like a prong could be introduced in the beginning. Like you can have a puppy, not on a front clip harness, but on a back clip harness and kind of put up with a little bit of that. You can shape behaviors with food. Try to get really, really good with teaching a dog or earning lifestyle that they don't just get food for free. 
uh, what they do and don't do is what gets them food. So focusing on you is what gets them food. Listening to you is what gets them food. Have fun taking the time with that stuff to teach all the behaviors so that later on, once they're known, then you can go into proofing behaviors and saying, hey, we need this. It's not just when I ask it of you and you choose whether or not not to do it. It's like you must do this, right? So that's really, really important. Um, but as far as like keeping sessions, keep them really, really short. Like when we're working our dogs, we work our dogs for like 10 minutes, like max in like feeding sessions with a puppy. No more than 10 minutes. You can keep it even like five minute short sessions, working a dog good and then just let them free. You want to end the session with a dog wanting more, not saying, oh, I've had enough. I'm, de I'm depleted. Like, I okay, I get it. I get it. You don't want that. You want a dog that it's over and they're like, holy cow, but that was really fun. I want to, so that, when we, that way when you come back to it, anytime you're giving them direction, anytime you're engaging with them, they want to choose you over anything else, right? So keep sessions really, really short. Down is a little bit of a trickier command. Um, I would say work on sitting, working on just free shaping, getting a dog to follow food, using either verbal markers or clicker markers. We use verbal markers. Hey! Right, so. You guys get to see this right here. Does she knock? Come here. Hey, down. So you guys get to see this here, right? Penny. Hey, I got her. Penny, place. Down. All right. Soko, where was he? Oh, place. So that was our error. You guys can replay that and see what happened. Just get, just get uh, PJ. Soko, down. Good. Come here, you. So this is tough because everybody's coming off, right? Herman, stop. Cut it out. Sit. Down. All right. So this is why, like, sometimes it's tough when you have like a lot of dogs that are still in the training point. It would have been easier if you had the dogs that know what to do and the one dog that like doesn't listen. But um, that was pretty, pretty difficult. Um, so whatever, you get to see it. Like for me, like most people will be like, oh my gosh, like cut it, <laughs> that's it, like the show's over. It's like, no, yeah. we follow through, we get what we want. I make sure it, it's convenient. I don't know if you can see it on camera, the lady's still there. Um, she, she probably knocked or just tried to say hi and stuff. And, that was that we followed through. So I mentioned earlier, PJ was out of practice. That's what makes it hard when you don't have a recall on a dog. These two don't really do much of that. Um, and that, that's unfortunate, but you know, whatever, that, that's fine. Um, and then you just follow through with it, right? So that's it. Uh, we'll see where I was. I'm actually gonna turn this guy around this way really, really quickly. Sit down. So now what, we're in the middle. Get her, get her a card or something. She's trying to come in, I think. Oh, no, um, no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, 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 probably. Like, yeah. yeah, she's trying to open the door, and she's like, not a good time. So that's that. So you can see how I follow through here, which is going to be important. Shh. Hey, this one used to charging doors and stuff like that. Hey, stop. Shh. No. Good. Good, that's what I want to see. I, don't, I hope you guys can see this. A little pos positional switch here. Um, and these guys will kind of watch. Nino, down. Good, I'll just continue with what we were answering. So the person is in, they got buzzed in and stuff. People see, they know not to bark now, which is pretty good. Um, so going into the puppy, um, teaching the basics, teaching how to free shape, teaching the markers, we use three markers, getting those markers known. You can do a lot without ever having to really touch a dog. You know what I mean? Like getting them to work for their food. Um, it's not true free shaping, but it is shaping behaviors, knowing when to have them stay. Um, not by saying stay a thousand times, but using the marker good. And then letting them know what they're waiting for, what the release is, which would be the yes, right? Um, and then there's the nope. Um, that goes into using, hey, using leash pressure and stuff like that and going into all that good stuff. Um, let's see what else we we're looking at. Geek And then around the, pro around, I'd say like 
four to six months. That's, can you lower that uh, music one volume? Um, that's when I would introduce to the prong collar and stuff. In the meantime, I just had the dog on a harness, just on a, on a, 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 uh, a back clip harness, not a front clip harness, right? Then we have a guitard. Hi, Blake. Would you ever support dogs staying out of a crate while alone at home? Or do you always have them in a crate? Um, where am I here? When not home, how would you teach a dog to be able to be without a crate when left alone at home? My dog is crate trained, but because of that, he is having trouble with big spaces when left alone. And since crates with doors are illegal in Sweden, what? I would, I, I, I would love to get rid of mine if that's possible. Hold, who makes the rules in Sweden? Are like, are like remote collars and crates? I've never heard of that. Like, whoever's in charge there, like, ask to see their dog. <laughs> that, that would be a great one to be like, let's see what your dog is like. Okay, if a dog is struggling with big spaces, they're not responsible enough for big spaces, right? You have to build that in small increments. Letting a dog roam free while you're gone when they're not good with it, um, giving them more of that is not going to train them to do that, right? Like, if I'm struggling with a, with a, with a drug, if I'm struggling with a drug addiction, Every time it's 2 to 4 a.m. at this club, me going there more to practice being at that club at 2 to 4 a.m. is not going to help me with my drug addiction, right? It, it, it's not something that, that makes sense. Um, that's crazy. I mean, what you're going to have to do is, first off, how, why, why would crates be illegal? Yeah, that's right. Well, I don't think anyone can see it, but basically, let's say you're not using a crate. Forget the phone. Um, if you're looking at a confined space, you want to slowly build that in slow increments and teach your dog a habit. So the whole point of a crate for us is it's a habit shaper, right? Like my dog was crate trained. I don't have my dog in a crate at all. He doesn't sleep in a crate. He, he just, I just leave him because he has the habit of what he did in a crate when I'm gone. Because this is the reality. A dog that is well behaved while you're gone is not running around throwing a party, whether they live in a mansion or they live in a one, a one bedroom apartment, right? Um, you have, hey, down. Sophie. Nope, stop. It's not living in a, uh, a, a like throwing a, a party, right? It's just a reality. A dog that is behaving, a dog that's getting into trouble is, is the one that's running around throwing a party. A dog that's behaving is the one that's just chilling out doing this. Dogs sleep over 60% of their life, I'm pretty sure the percentage is. I don't know the exact percent, but that means that like while your dogs are home, they're, they're somewhere sleeping, right? So if they're not doing that, they're getting themselves into trouble. So what we want to teach is the habit of basically doing this. I can tell you right now, that's what my dog does. Like he might grab a bone at some point and chew on it, but we already have like, you're going you're gonna to add something? Okay, we already have like a habit, so because that habit is gone, now that he's been crate trained up until he was, I don't know, I was in college, maybe like two years old, two and a half years old, like he just, like I can put him in a crate, no problem. Like he's been in a crate at like seminars, but like I just don't use it anymore because like this is the habit. He knows when it's okay to play and when it's not. You know what I mean? Um, you get, you can add. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the crate is like, kind of like a babysitter, so you have like these, these, these walls, but the reality is like you're kind of introducing that habit to a placemat, and then eventually you don't need it. Like I hardly place my dog anymore. There's, some, there's rare situations where like my wife will place, will place him because if she's ordering something, he's a little more like quote unquote like protective or defensive of her, not in a way that can't be controlled, but in a way that we want him to kind of act a certain way when she's home alone in New York City. Um, but like she'll place him so he can kind of stay more on edge kind of watching whoever is coming into the house to do whatever work if I'm not around. Um, so she'll actually place him. But for me, it's like I can tell him, go away. I don't care what you do. I don't need you over here or I want you to down over here. So, I mean, it's just what it is. Um, but yeah, like we use crate training to get them to a point where they're responsible enough where they don't need to be in a crate. And if your dog is struggling in a bigger space, then we need to keep them in that smaller space so they can do better. The odds are there, there is a struggle in the crate as well. Um, two hounds, two horses. 
Hey Blake, my dog barks and lunges at the neighbors over our backyard fence. She's okay with other people and dogs when we go on walks and when people come in our house, just not in the backyard. When I hear her barking or whining, I call her to come in the house. Besides doing recall, is there anything else I can work on with her? It looks like a mix of anxiety and her guarding the backyard, yeah. Um, thanks so much, I'm loving all the training tips on Periscope too. Awesome, thanks uh, for following us on all the different platforms that we offer. First thing I'm gonna say, it's good that you're starting with recall, so if you taught an alternative solution, now you need to interrupt a little bit more. You can't say, no, put that down, do this, no, put that down, do this, because if there's no consequence, if you actually wanna stop it, it's very difficult to teach a dog not to do it. You're teaching them another choice, but sometimes that's something that they're not understanding, you'd rather them not do it, right? So every time I try to rob a bank, the cops come and they catch me with the money bags and they go, hey, don't rob the bank. And I go, okay, and I'm like, you got me. And I put the bags down. They go, well, as long as you put the money bags down, get out of here. If there's no consequence, I'm gonna keep trying it until I actually get away, right, with murder. Or, or to make things worse, if, the, if I choose to put it down and not continue with it, I get rewarded for doing so. So it's like you're telling me that if I get caught in the act, I listen to you while I get caught, you're gonna reward me to tell me not to do it again. But if I didn't get caught, I would be even richer. It's like a, it's a catch-22, you know what I mean? It's a lose-lose for, for the person that's trying to teach you not to do that. So at this point, you have to let it be known that they're not allowed to do that. So I, I would say this is a rare situation where I say you gotta correct that dog and do it in a way where they start understanding that it's specifically for that. Nope, good, now come do this instead. Uh-uh, don't do that so they know. So eventually you can be, hey, and you don't always have to recall your dog, you're just calling them off of that distraction. Uh-uh, and they're like, oh yeah, don't do that. Do whatever, you're free to use the yard, but don't do that, you know better. And that's an interruption where it's a little bit of a, of a correction where you're like, oh, okay, don't do that. Do you want me to come to you? No, you don't have to come to me. Do your thing, just don't do that. And they're like, okay, thanks for the heads up so you can referee, right? Um, guys, that is episode 21. You got to see some of, some of the good stuff, right? Not perfect, and that's how we love it, because um, that's what it's about. It's about seeing how we follow through there, right? Um, that is it, guys. I will see you next week.